The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Invisible Influence Series. If you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion, then make sure you text the word COMPEL to 411321. That's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1-909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Welcome to the Influencer's Edge. This is the place where you come to get the latest breakthroughs, cutting edge insights, tools, and techniques to leapfrog over the pack in sales, persuasion, and influence. Be sure you visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com. And while you're there, Subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, tune in, and enjoy today's episode. All right, welcome back to the Influencer's Edge. We have a guest today who's so special. I was just talking to her in the little green room saying, I want to hire her as my coach. I want to get a coaching session or two. And she said, okay, we can play. Well, our guest today is Nicole Hess. Nicole has so many interesting things about her. And I warned her, I'm going to sort of put her on my therapist couch and figure out what makes her tick. And you need to listen to her because she went from broke bartender to seven figure CEO in 13 months. Now, Nicole, my question is, uh, are you married? Do you have a lot of money? Answer the second question first. (laughs) (laughs) You don't need to answer. That's a Groucho Marx line. This is fantastic. We'll dive into the rest of your biography in a minute. And we're going to talk about catalyst marketing. And we're going to talk about your company values of transparency and self-sovereignty. Blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But wow, wow, wee wah, broke bartender. Are there any super rich bartenders? Doesn't that sort of go along? What was your dream while you were bartending? Did you, were you going to be an actor or a singer or a tap dancer what was your dream while you were bartending you know paul i was actually on my way to law school like a good girl when i fell behind the bar um and you know i fell in love with like the people you know like the people part of it of like this like psychology of sitting at the bar and listening and understanding people in their like rawest like most animalistic form right because Ooh. that's what they're like when they're drinking and so i got really captivated in all of those things and for me I was president of the bartenders guild. I was doing international cocktail competitions and doing bar consulting stuff. So I never had the dream of being an actor. I just wanted to be a really great bartender and I wanted to open my own bar. That doesn't surprise me. I thought, you know, she probably was the very best bartender she could possibly be. (laughs) I'm not joking because you probably, I've read biographies of people who have been super successful and they worked various odd jobs. So they always thought I'm going to be the best food server possible howard stern we all know who howard stern is he makes like 300 350 million dollars a year he said when he was working crappy little radio stations spinning records for a station that no one listened to he still went in there every day and put in the best day's work he could so you must have seen some interesting stories Uh, did you ever see people on a really bad date and you could tell it was a bad date Oh yeah, for sure. I think bad dates were pretty, it was pretty common. It was like, yeah, we had, we had a promotion called bad date Wednesdays. (laughs) Fantastic. Now that's a big journey. Seven figure, uh, broke bartender to seven figures. So I want to know, we'll get into all the details of how, where, what, when, who, Usually when someone has this level of drive, this level of success, they have a model, they have a mentor, someone in their life who was their inspiration. Was this just how you were born or was there a person or people along your journey who encouraged you or who were were models for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've got the entrepreneurial genes, right? Like um, my grandparents started the trash company. We're real Italians, you know? So my grandparents started the trash company um, here locally in Reno a long, long time ago. And then my mom actually bought 
that company from them when she was 24, 25. She bought it from them and took that company that was very mom and pop and my grandpa was giving away everything for free and all the things, you know, and she turned that into, um, you know, a, a multi-million dollar company that she ended up selling to waste management. What is the, oh, okay. So you basically turn trash into big bucks. That's right. <laughs> ah. She's the trash queen. That's fantastic. So you obviously, you had role models along the way and you had it in your blood, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Does not work well for others, I guess. <laughs> oh, no, I, I have plenty of doctors and lawyers and academics in my family, but I'm the only, no, I have a sister who's quite wealthy being an entrepreneur. So what were some of your biggest struggles, self-doubts on that journey the rocket that was a rocket journey so let me back up how did you handle suddenly having all that money 13 well, months from broke to 13 months later how'd you handle having money because sometimes having money it's certainly better than not having any but having money does a number on your head yeah i mean i think the first response was definitely panic you know it was the feeling of is this for, is this real? I mean, I went from being a bartender and I mean, I made good money as a bartender, but I worked 90 hours a week. You know, That's it was great. like you worked and it made sense. Like you worked this amount of money, this amount of hours and you made this amount of money. Right. But I remember it was my third month doing the online coaching thing. And I made $60,000 inside of two weeks. Whoa. Screech so breaks on. Hold the mustard and shut the door and bar it. Uh, I forget the Southern expression. Say that number again. Yeah, in my, it was my third month in coaching. And inside of two weeks, I made $60,000. How were, we'll ask how you did that second. Did you stare at the bank balance in, on your screen or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I, I like, didn't believe it was real. I thought somebody was going to take it from me. <laughs> you know, I was like, they're not really going to give me this money. <laughs> I can't imagine what the bank was thinking. It was like, what? Like this, this doesn't make any sense for you. Um, I'm sure they had some ideas about where the money came from. That was probably not so much on the up and up. Right. <laughs> yeah. You probably got a financial report sent to the, I wouldn't even say that three letter agency, the vampire squids. <laughs> yeah, no, it was definitely a red flag kind of thing. And I mean, it, it moves so quick and psychologically that does things to you, you know, of changing the way you're perceiving yourself, but also the fear of the way other people are perceiving you. I remember posting that because that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to tell people how much money you made, which was really uncomfortable in the beginning. And so like I told people, I was like, yeah, you know, I had, I made $60,000 and the hate mail that I got from this, Paul, unbelievable, no, so envy. much hate. And, you know, it was right in the middle of COVID too. So that didn't help. Wow. I've never had a guest talk about the reality of envy and hate that people would shoot your way. Whereas I would be at your door going, how can you coach me? What can I do to make you my mentor? That I, I think this is one of the big things that gets in the way of people's success is envy. And when you can convert envy into blessing other people for the success and then seeking their mentorship, it takes a big leap. Wow, that is fantastic. So let's dive into your the rest of your biography. But you see, this is more interesting than I think any printed biography. I'll go through it. So we already talked about the fact that you are a self-made millionaire who went from being a broke bartender to a seven-figure CEO in just 13 months. And she took that $60,000 and probably looked at it and like, <laughs> and uh, she has empowered thousands of entrepreneurs in the online world to monetize their skill sets and results. The ripple impact that the Colas had online in the online world is just beginning as her clients have not only made millions of their own, but have had their own clients turn, wow, hitting seven figures in their first businesses as well. Holy, Raholis, Shmagolis, and Shmagadies, as my mom would say. So Nicole's unique perspective on the world of sales is fascinating. She stands firmly against traditional 
pain point tactics. Love it, love it, love it. This is called the influencer's edge because we interviewed people who are contrarians and don't buy into the traditional stuff. And instead uses her signature strategy of catalyst marketing to attract unicorn clients. Wow. So let's talk about what is catalyst marketing? What are the like top three main elements and how does it turn away from traditional marketing and pain point selling? It's faster. The whole point of catalyst marketing is that we skip that part where you really talk to people when they're in their pain, which is what traditional marketing tells you to do. It says, hey, you know, connect with people in their struggle. What are you struggling with? What are you, what is your problem? Like, and the problem with talking to people in their problem is that they have a very long journey to go through before they're actually ready to change. People who are in their pain are married to their pain. They like it. They want to stay there and it takes them a long time six, eight months, 10 years <laughs> to change their mind about that. You know. When I decided to build my marketing strata, I decided to only and exclusively talk to people who were already on the other side, where they'd already been through the pain, they'd hit their rock bottom, and they'd already inspired their own hope. Instead of expecting me to be their hope, they were already in a place of hope and have already decided that they're going to figure out what the solution is. They just don't know what that solution is for them at that moment. And that's where catalyst marketing comes in, is that you speak to people who have already gone through rock bottom. They've already released their pain. They've already chosen their own hope. And they've already decided that they're going to create results. They're just looking for the methodology. And so uh, then we focus on that pinpoint timeline that allows them to take action. I love what you said. They've chosen their own hope. You didn't say they found it or they discovered it. You said they'd chosen their own hope. Now, I'm a master in neurolinguistic programming, so I listen for words. Words have a lot of power. So can you talk about that very unique distinction that they've chosen their own hope? I think that people think that hope falls out of the sky in a bucket. <laughs> and that's not how that works, right? Is that we all have the capacity for every single emotion on the face of the planet, including hope. We have the capacity for that. And we get to choose when we allow ourselves to be inspired by hope. We can be hopeful in the dreariest of situations, right? And people who are in the best situations can completely abandon hope. Hope isn't something that happens to you. It's something that you choose to embody for yourself. This is fantastic. Normally I could be verbose, but this is blowing me away for real. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. So that's a great distinction. At what point in your journey did you suddenly realize, wait, wait, yeah, the pain point stuff makes people a lot of money, but that's not my tribe that I want to be speaking to. How did you make that distinction? What was your moment of discovery where you thought, yeah, this traditional stuff, I can see it's made a lot of marketers a lot of money, but I don't want to go there. Let me think of something else. What was your process for doing that? My aha moment was when I was being trained for sales because I didn't really know anything about the sales world outside of bartender, bartender sales, which is very similar in a lot of ways, but obviously different in circumstance. And so I was being trained through, you know, scripts and pain point poking and, and all of the emotional development pieces. And I had this like feeling that rippled back to a, a previous relationship. I was in a narcissistic abusive relationship that was physically abusive, mentally sorry. abusive, and financially abusive. He I'm stole sorry. my identity, racked up 30 grand in, in debt. Like, I mean, it was just a nightmare, right? And really when I was listening to the sales strategies, I heard his voice in my head because I realized that he was pain point poking me in wow. order to control and manipulate me. Wow. And I said, oh no, I will not do this to other people. I don't care if it makes money. I'm not interested. Wow. So had you not been through that horrific, hellish relationship, do you think you would have been where you are now with your business? Absolutely not. That's really amazing. I think it goes to the point that it speaks to the point that sometimes when we're going through a hard time we don't know what the lessons are going to be until after we move through it and that pain can actually turn into treasure 
if we know how to get the right perspective. That's a brilliant insight you made, insight you made, mapping over the pain from a relationship. You saw the relationship of how that works in selling. You said, no, that's not what I want to do. What can I do differently? And who are the people who I can appeal to and sell this unique perspective and skills that flow from it? Is that a good summary? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much how it happened. And, you know, my, the people who were teaching me, my coaches, um, they told me it would never work. Both of them. And both of them were very successful and I, and I love them dearly, but both of them told me it would never work. And then they all got to sit back and eat those words a year later because I made money faster than they did. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So I want to know that being the case, how did you go about Why the word catalyst? I get where you're coming from. I like this idea of setting forth people. It's an overused term, but I get it. Their avatar, not necessarily by industry, but by psychology. What is the psychology? Because so many people also say you need a niche really narrow. You need to do only one industry only, only do real estate, only do mortgage, only do HVAC. But it sounds to me like you're teaching people from all different kinds of businesses, but they're people who appeal, have that psychological mindset. Is that correct? I have a different perspective on what it means to niche. I don't think that niche is indicative of a demographic like thir- women 35 to 45, right? I don't think that niche has anything to do with the industry that you're in. I think that niche is the specific positioning of what desired result you have at this moment. Can you unpack that for me? Yeah. So if you're thinking about like, okay, somebody comes into my program and so they want to build a successful online business. There's people that want to build a successful online business alongside of their nine to five. They don't really want to leave. They just want to kind of stay. They want to, you know, sell comic books and have hobbies, right? And they want to make, you know, maybe an extra $500 a month and save up for a vacation. That's a niche of people. Now they could sell anything. They could be any age demographic, but their desire is to have a side business that generates $500 a month. Some people come to me and say, Nicole, I am leaving my entire life behind. I don't care what it takes. I will make $100,000 a month. That is a different niche. They They completely change the way they think and feel about themselves in the moments of becoming the person to make the decision to kind of go all in on themselves. So they're a completely different niche. They speak a completely different language than the person who wants a hobby. It's it's a different mindset that they're already coming to you with. Yes. And so you, you are the catalyst for that mindset to grow or you're the, you're not the catalyst that creates that mindset. They already come to you with it. They're in their catalyst. They are their own source. I am a contribution. I am not the source. That is so remarkable. I have another business that I don't discuss here because I'm keeping the brand separate. And it has drained me to be the source of hope for other people. It just is not anything I want to do anymore, even though it's made me nice coin. It's just driven me crazy over the years. So I totally get it. Well, I'm still kind of reeling, but processing, getting that, wrapping my head around this idea that they had chosen their own hope. I've never heard that before. That is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So catalyst marketing, they're their own catalyst or how does unpack what catalyst marketing is again? So with the catalyst, these are people who have already chosen. So they have already gone through rock bottom. They already let go of the pain, but they've been in the space of saying, okay, this is the decision that I'm making. I am going to build a successful six figure a month business. That is what I'm doing. I'm going to be choosing which modality that I want, which coach, which vehicle, which path to take to get there. But they've already decided that this is what they are doing. It's not what they want to do. It's not a dream. It's already been a decision. And so that catalyst inside of them, for a lot of people, like for me, I got fired, right? So I got fired from not one, but two of those bartender jobs in the same month. And so in getting fired, I had a choice. I could go and work at another bar. I was a very sought out bartender. I could have gone and worked somewhere else. 
but I made a different decision. I said, I am not going back to bartending. I am going to create a different life for myself. And now at the time, there's no way I could have imagined this life, but I decided I didn't want to go back to the bar and that I was going to create my own business. I wanted to work for myself and I wasn't going back to bartending. So I was in the catalyst of deciding and then a different modality presented itself, right? Got it. Got it. Let's talk about transparency and self-sovereignty. Sovereignty is a big thing for me. I, I love that word. And I like the word of being the word transparency, but we all have different definitions of that. So this is your culture and your business. What do you mean? What is your definition first and foremost of transparency? For me, transparency is being able to see yourself in the truest light. And most people can't do this, right? Most people refuse to do this, really, is that they're not willing to own their mistakes. They're not willing to be in radical responsibility. They're not willing to be in a state of saying, I could be better and committing to improvement. Transparency is how you view yourself and then how you allow the world to view you viewing yourself. That takes a lot of courage and a lot of clarity. Yes. Okay. I get it. I scribbled something down because you said something that, again, you're dropping a lot of gold nuggets. And one of the things I realized early on, I realized early on in doing podcasts is when I interview someone who has a lot of brilliance, a lot of excellence, they don't even know when they're dropping gold, <laughs> liquid gold is coming out of their mouth. So my job is to go, wait a minute, let's turn that liquid gold into ingots, gold ingots that my audience and viewers can carry away. So let's talk, you said radical responsibility. Does this mean if I'm walking down the street and a drunk driver comes barreling down on me, I view it that I'm responsible for that accident? People have this crazy idea that you create everything that happens in your reality, at which point I said, well, so the Jewish kids created the Nazis who mowed them down. So that's not what you're talking about, obviously. What do you mean by radical and what do you mean by responsibility? And then what do you mean by radical responsibility? I'm into words. That's, that's my jam. Every thought that comes through your mind was chosen by you. Nobody could choose that for you. Only you could choose your thought. And that thought comes from a question. And so in radical responsibility, we're in the space of acknowledging the fact that the question only came from you. You ask yourself a question every day. When I was in self-sabotage patterns, that question was, what's the point? And so you can see how that leads to self-sabotaging thoughts, right? What's the point? All of the pity, all of the things, right? And so radical responsibility to me, radical meaning that you are going to be in the space of looking at every single thought that you have, which is what 60,000 some odd thoughts you have every day and being in that radical level of seeing how many thoughts you are creating every single day. And so therefore how many feelings, how many actions and how many behaviors are coming as a derivative of this responsibility means that even those kids that are in the Holocaust still had the ability to think. They were still in a space where some of them survived. Some of them got through that. How? That is a horrific thing to survive. But because they had control of their own thoughts in their own heads, they were able to survive the most unthinkable situation in the world that would crumble most people. Your thoughts and your feelings are your choice. And no matter what freedoms people take away from us, they cannot take away that freedom. So let me push back a little bit because I love to push back on my guests and the smarter they are, the more they enjoy it. How's that for a loop? Uh, <laughs> mind, mind trap. A lot of people I know would say, wait, 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 whoa, let's slow down here. There's such a thing as propaganda. There's such a thing as mass marketing where people's thoughts really are shaped by the popular culture. It's so insidiously that oftentimes what we think are our own thoughts, what we think are our own desires are really just put in there by popular media. One of my old friends is an attorney. And he said, back when I was a kid in the 60s, it was okay to be middle class, to have a house and a nice job and a family. This whole thing of I want to be super wealthy and I have to be a star, this has been planted in people's head 
by media and pop culture and the Kardashians. This is why I don't watch TV unless it's Cartoon Network or the or South Park that I watch. So <laughs> what would you say to someone who said, wait a minute, entire nations have been controlled by propaganda, have been controlled, I don't mean to insult you, this is your jam, have been controlled by the programming of organized religion, who would say to you, this idea that all the thoughts are in your head are your own. Uh, who would say, no, that's not true, because so much of our, what we think are our own thoughts are just what we're copying from parents, whether they've been jammed in there by media, propaganda, wow, I'm being long winded to be cynical, et cetera. When you are a child, your parents speak to you, the media speaks to you, your teachers speak to you, school speaks to you, and you are sponging, right? And you are being programmed. That's literally what's happening. But everything that has been programmed in your life has still been your self-sovereign choice because you get to, as an adult, decide which of those beliefs you perpetuate and move forward because belief is nothing but a set of repetition. And so I could hear propaganda and be told that this is the way the world is. But if you picked me up and you moved me over to a different con continent and just plopped me down in the middle of it, I could also take on those new beliefs, right? So it is my choice whether I want to entangle and enmesh with those thoughts and feelings of the people around me. If it wasn't possible for us to deviate and break from that, we would never have rebels. And we know that's not a thing, right? Yes. I'm not saying I don't believe you. I happen to share your beliefs. I'm just doing the pushback to clarify what, what you mean. And for the audience members who are probably pushing back in their heads, I'm sort of leaping into their heads and voicing it for them. I love that word untangle. Very, very important skill set. Are you by any chance a meditator? Of course. Yeah. I mean, I think well, we all are, right? <laughs> well, no, I mean a formal sitting practice. I do Vipassana, mindfulness meditation, and it's really helped me to untangle my own limiting beliefs and unlimiting and uh, limited thoughts because they come up in a place where I can have clarity and not tell a story around them and not be attached to them. So you have uh, there's a word in Tibetan Buddhism called Vajra, V-A-J-R-A. It either means thunderbolt or diamond, depending on how you use it. But you've mm -hmm. got both. You've got thunderbolt presence and a diamond mind. It's very, <laughs> very, and well, I mean it. It's really, really, a diamond is beautiful, but the diamond can be honed to cut through anything. It's the hardest substance in the world. They use it to drill through metal, to drill through anything. So, wow. I'm I'm sort of blown away here. I'm gushing. <laughs> we're going to take a break while I do that. No, we're not taking any break. We'll keep going. So I meant that, do you have a formal sitting practice? I don't. You know, for me, I view myself more as the person, like the entity that is witnessing my experience. And so for me, as I'm waking up every single day, um, I have conditioned myself to wake up in, in theta state and to become aware yeah. of my thoughts and my feelings before I actually start thinking in beta, right? Can you, um, I know what you mean by theta. Mm -hmm. They may not know. So can you tell us, generally speaking, you don't have to dive into the science. What is theta state and how did you learn to get there? We have different alpha waves, theta waves, uh, beta waves that are happening within our minds at all times, right? And so there's different transitionary periods between sleep. And you've heard of like REM cycle, right? So being in like REM cycle, um, if you've ever been like lucid dreaming, right? Or if you've yes. been in that thing, like have you ever driven your car and like all of a sudden you're at the store? <laughs> yes. And, like forget of like how yeah. you drove there, right? Our brains, uh, they create this autopilot kind of feel at times. And so if you practice, then you can start to begin to access this more subconscious way of thinking where you're more suggestible. And so obviously we don't want to use that to become suggestible to the propaganda, right? But we can <laughs> use that to be more suggestible to our desires and our, the beliefs that we do want to cultivate inside of ourselves. And so I created this practice, um, you know, of really just being aware of it as I'm going to sleep and then setting the intention that I will wake up in this state and that I will be able to witness myself activating this brilliant uh, i've been doing hypnosis and mm -hmm. self-hypnosis for over 30 years it's absolutely right on target with 
create a hypnotic state. So let's get into self-sovereignty, I think, is just tied in with radical res responsibility. I think you've covered that. That's basically the element of it, or are there more elements to it? I think that we give away a lot of our sense of self um, in current climate. And maybe it was always like this. I don't know because I wasn't there. But I can tell you, like, in current climate with social media, we have very little self-sovereignty um, because right. we're constantly at the mercy of the little dings and the little notifications and us other people telling us if we're good enough or not based on how many hearts are on our pictures, right? And so we surrender a lot of our sense of self um, trying to be what other people want us to be on, you know, Instagram. And so we don't have a lot of that inner knowing. And so we, we give it away. We wait for other people to affirm us. We're looking for constant approval, constant validation, and even constant just attention, right? So that we lose that sight of being able to amplify our own sense of being, um, it's uncomfortable for us. It's we're much more comfortable in a social setting, in a social media setting than we are just being in our own energy. And so self-sovereignty is the radical responsibility for our thoughts and our feelings, our behaviors, our actions. But it is also the inner sense of knowing, um, of being able to tap into your inner sense of being, regardless of what other people are or are not doing. Do you... Do you truly believe in your heart of hearts and in that brilliant Vajra mind of yours that every human is capable of this, given the right guidance? I do. I think that anybody that is, has the will for this, we cannot fabricate the will for someone else. That's what I'm saying. That's begging the question to people. Do you think everyone has the capability for that will to build it? Or are some people just sheep? I have been told that 70% of the population was born sheep and that they will never change. But I don't believe that's for lack of capacity. I do believe it's for lack of desire. And I do believe to a certain extent for lack of believing that it is possible. But I mean, we're, we are contrarians to that of saying that, you know, you can't <laughs> look at the person next to you and say, it's not possible if they're doing it. <laughs> I love, I love contrarians. I only want contrarian listeners and viewers i only want contrarian guests i only want contrarian clients because that's just if, if you're like everybody else why should anybody pick you and that's just the way i think you and i both think wow let's talk about trend we hit transparency did we talk about transparency aren't there times when you should not be transparent if i'm if a again i'm pushing i like to push back if I'm going to grandma's house for Christmas and she knits me a horrific sweater and said, oh, don't you love your sweater, Paul? Should I be transparent and say, grandma, I wouldn't wear this rag uh, at my funeral. What What do you do? Isn't uh, Aren't there social constraints and social rules when it's time not to be transparent and or authentic and you need to be ob oblique or opaque is the word? How much do you love your grandma? Well, I, I, my grandma passed before I knew her, but I assume if I loved her the way I love my mother, I would say I would be in love with her. So then generally transparency isn't designed to be cruel, right? It's designed to be honest. And so in the honesty of receiving a sweater that is not the prettiest sweater in the world, we're not saying to grandma, this is the most beautiful sweater I've ever seen in the world. You're saying to grandmother, thank you so much for thinking of me. It means a lot to me that you really have taken the time to create something from your heart that's just for me. I love I'm you. Still I'm still transparent. Just, I'm just not going to push you into saying anything negative. I love it. I love it. <laughs> My audience at this point is going to write me an email going, wow, you've been such a bastard to that lovely guest. It's, I keep it up, Paul. <laughs> I keep it up. I know because you're super brilliant and you like the stimulation of someone pushing back. Do people ever, I find you fascinating and engaging and engrossing. Do people ever, not that you would even give one hoot for a second did people ever tell you that you're intimidating you're not to me to me you're you're like wow magnetic did people ever tell you that all my life all your life all my life i got sent to the principal's office when i was in kindergarten <laughs> i've got an answer for them you ready <laughs> yeah <laughs> Did you get sent to the principal? Me too. But for being a, the class goof, you you probably went for different reasons. 
Yeah. All right. They so called, they called me bossy, Paul. You know. They called you what? They called me bossy. 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 I don't. I don't. I don't get it. I don't read that at all. <laughs> all right. Wow. What have we not covered here? We've gotten. Uh, oh, you talked about unicorn clients. Surely you don't want people with a horn through their head. So what do you mean by a unicorn <laughs> client? I think you're a unicorn. Look at you. That's that's the goal. That's the goal. You know, in my, in my industry, in the coaching industry, you see a lot of people that are in this thing. They say, soul aligned. Hold on one second. We need unicorn clients. So let's pick it up. Ladies and gentlemen, we had to take a pause because there was a ginormous helicopter flying right over my domicile here. Yes. Let's talk about unicorn clients. So in the coaching industry, we have a lot of coaches talking about soul aligned and dream clients and perfect clients. Um, and I don't believe in this, Paul, because I know that perfect clients don't exist. <laughs> I've had enough of them. I've had over 2,300 clients in the last three years. And I can tell you perfect clients don't exist because perfect people don't exist. And well, so I'm not looking for a perfect client. I'm not interested in that. You know what I'm interested in? Growing. Well, I'm interested in growth. Paul. And so a unicorn client is a client who serves in one way and limits in another and creates the energetic stretch of reciprocal energy. They wait, wait, wait. So they, they help you grow in one way, but they limit in the other. Is that mm. what you said? Yeah. Why would we want to attract someone who imposes limits? Everything imposes limits because everything serves in one way and limits in another, right? Wait, that is that again with your Vajra brilliance? That's fantastic. I want to continue this conversation off the air. All right, Nicole, you've been one of the best guests we have ever had. <laughs> People are going to want to continue in the conversation with you. So, how do they go about doing that? What if they're as blown away by you as I am? How do they continue the discussion with you? Well, I have a couple avenues for you. I've got a Facebook group that has almost 20,000 members in it, and it's called Unicorn Client Attraction Secrets for High Vibe Wonder Women. And Whoa, for a higher <laughs> vibe wonder, I want to be a guest speaker on there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in the Facebook group, you know, it's for Wonder Women, but in my world, Wonder Woman is a mindset, not a gender bias. So all are welcome. Good. And if you are interested in some spicier, more explicit content, um, you can come check out my podcast. It's called Real Unicorns Don't Wear Pants. Wait a minute. I want to, let's talk about having me on that. Real Unicorns Don't Wear Pants. <laughs> <laughs> You have some natural marketing gifts there, uh, lady. I just want to tell you that. You're a great marketing copywriter, whether you know it or not. <laughs> Nicole Hess, will you come back on the show? I would love to. I would love to. We're going to have her back on the show. So this has been, <laughs> she's been one of the most interesting guests I've ever had. We've been very, very lucky. And so thank you so much. We will see and or hear you all or whatever on the i hope it's as good as this one on the next episode of the influencers edge catch you all later the influencers edge is brought to you by the invisible influence series if you're ready to massively increase your sales by leveraging the power of subconscious persuasion then make sure you text the word compel to 411321 that's COMPEL to 411321. And if you're outside of the United States, then use WhatsApp and text the word COMPEL to 1-909-741-1321. Make sure you put in your best email address because that's how we'll deliver the goodies. Thank you for tuning in to the Influencer's Edge, where you get the latest breakthroughs, cutting edge insights, tools and techniques so you can leapfrog over the pack at sales, influence, and persuasion. Remember to visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com to enjoy even more great episodes like this one. We look forward to seeing you again on The Influencers Edge Show. Mm -hmm.